Okay, everyone, I think we will go ahead and get started. Thank you all for making time to join us today. My name is Emily Swafford. I am Director of Academic and Professional Affairs here at the American Historical Association. Um, I'm very pleased that you've joined us today for one of the uh, webinars as part of our online teaching forum that we'll be, we've been, we'll be hosting for the next several months. Today's is Middle Ages for Educators, Online Resources and Strategies for Teaching the Pre-Modern. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes doing a little bit of logistical overview for how this is going to go, and then I'm going to turn this over to the presenters. And then I will also moderate the Q&A at the other end. Um, so welcome. Um, when we transition to the Q&A section of the webinar, I want to uh, ask you to please post your question in the chat box. We have turned off some of the settings, so if you would like to ask a question, please address the question, uh, please send it to the host. That way I will see it and I'll be able to uh, share it with the panelists. So again, when we get to the Q&A, uh, if you'll post your question in the chat box and make sure to, to send it to the host to me and I'll make sure to get it. And so now I'm just going to quickly introduce our panelists and then get out of the way and let them give you an overview to the fabulous tool that they have created. So they're here to talk about Middle Ages for Educators. I'm pleased to welcome Laura Mariali, who is an independent scholar and digital humanist who lives and works in Washington, DC. Merle Eisenberg, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center at the University of Maryland, and is a historian of pandemics and the Middle Ages. And last but not least, uh, because she ha probably has the best background of all of us right now, uh, Sarah McDougall, who teaches at John Jay College and the CUNY Graduate Center. So with that, with no further ado, I'd like to turn it over to the presenters uh, to uh, get it going. Thanks uh, so much, Emily, for the kind introduction. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, as Emily mentioned, we're going to run through kind of a background first. Um, I'm going to control uh, the slideshow. Uh, I will do part, Laura will do part, and Sarah will do part. So this might bring you back, if you ever took an art history class with big projectors in the back of the classroom, it might bring you back there because you're going to hear Laura and Sarah yelling out during their talks, next slide, please. Um, so hopefully it brings back some, you know, non-digital pleasant memories. So with that, let me share the PowerPoint. Okay. Are we good? Laura, give me a thumbs up if I'm good. Okay. Okay. So uh, thanks so much again for the introduction. Uh, and thanks as well. We want to give thanks to our uh, content managers um, uh, and Princeton University, who they are graduate students of. Um, and hopefully some more changes to the website through Princeton coming soon as well. Um, what you can see here is uh, Sarah, Laura, and myself uh, cover kind of three different areas of medieval history. I'm a late antique early medievalist. Sarah does medieval France as well as some thematic interests. And Laura does uh, the Mediterranean and our content managers who have been uh, adding more content uh, significantly as we move forward also covers the early Islam, Byzantine and Syriac studies as well as uh, more high medieval content. And so that's been a really wonderful way. I think we can add more content and we keep expecting to do that moving forward. The outline of today's talk, and I always like to give nice little outlines, especially on Zoom, so you guys can all follow along. Uh, I'm gonna lay out very briefly the goal of the site as we see it. Um, and then I'm gonna walk through the site. I know probably many of you have spent a little bit of time on the site, but if you haven't spent a whole lot of time, I'm gonna walk through the teaching aspects of it. And then Laura's gonna take us through the four different, uh, what we call levels of uh, pedagogy, we might call the digital pedagogical interaction that we use to envision the website using. And then third, Sarah's gonna respond to some of your really, really wonderful questions and comments and ideas that you all posed of what we can and what we can't do and how we're adapting the site moving forward. So without further ado, as I said, I'm gonna start and you can follow the red as we move along with the goal of the site. So what's the point of the Middle Ages for educators, right? And here, as I like to say in many instances, I'm gonna be as blunt uh, as I can be, um, and as I, uh, as I think we should at this point. All of us, or many of us, are teaching in all types of weird, hybrid, synchronous, asynchronous, a little bit of everything, right? Some of you may be asked to have designed, you know, four different syllabi around the same lecture course. Um, and so what we're aiming to do here is to provide you with content um, that you can then just take and import into your class, right? So the goal is to make everyone's life easier 
to have more resources to teach with, right? So as, as I joked to Lauren Sanger the other day, I said, you know, what we really want is you to just literally steal our content, right? To use it and to build it in. So if you want to think about it this way, um, maybe you teach a 15 week semester and you're teaching twice a week in an hour, 15 minute course, right? So you have 30 classes to figure out, right? Well, what we want to offer are tools, um, videos, discussion plans, lesson plans, where you can take some of these and just use them freely in your own, right? We're not going to be a full replacement for all 30 classes. Everyone teaches their own way, their own content, um, but we might be able to cover, say, five of them. Maybe five of them are of interest or five of them you already have baked in and you want to use them for tools. So literally use the tools is what we really want you to do to take the videos, take the discussion questions and build them in as part of your lesson plans. So I just put up on the screen one example. Um, this is from Hannah Barker. Uh, she gave us a wonderful 15-ish minute talk, which is what all the talks we have are. Um, on the Black Death, right? I imagine probably most of you, if you teach a pre-modern course, probably have a section on the Black Death. Um, I'm going to be certain that you're either going to expand it, certainly not going to cut it, uh, given what we're all going through. Um, but what Hannah has given you here is really nice information on how to teach this. And I've left up a screenshot here uh, where she discusses, for example, the plague cycle. Right? This is the complex interaction between the bacterium Yersinia pestis and how it gets to humans, different types of plague. And she nicely lays this out on the screen. So she gives you the full scientific background of how this works, right? So she really lays out the basics and the foundations. And then as you can see here, she also has primary sources that we hope you all use, discussion questions, as well as additional readings. If you want to know more to prepare or your students want to know more or you want to teach more or do a broader Black Death lecture. Now, the other thing, and this is you can see on the bottom of your screen here, on the bottom right, um, one of the major issues I've seen come up in a number of these pedagogical teaching webinars that I've been to are questions of accessibility, right? There's gonna be no magic bullet um, to all of us teaching online, but what we try to offer you on the website are different options. So let's say you have students who have, uh, don't have their own home computer or have not great Wi-Fi. What we also offer here in these lesson plans are other options. So for example, if you don't have the Wi-Fi to be able to watch Hannah's video, uh, we've given you background on a, on a short podcast that's about 30 minutes long that covers many of the same topics, right? Because most people do have often some type of smartphone and abilities to download a podcast. So that'd be an alternative way you could assign this, right? So you may not be able to watch the video, but if you listen to this podcast, um, this will give you some of those same mechanics. So we're trying to build in as many different ways of people learning as possible. So as I say, the point of MAFE at the end of the day is for you to take these lessons and to build them in, right? We should get past the point, I think, where we're all just going to be filming 50 minute or hour, hour and 15 minute lectures over and over and over again and each person doing this, right? So if we can cut down on some of that time and the technical uh, background, that's really the goal at the end of the day. So now I want to walk you through the other parts of the site very, very briefly, as I said, um, and this will all be uh, kind of covered or you can go explore the website to know more about all of these. So most of these teaching resources, there are other resources on the website, um, uh, are here under teaching resources and you can see the drop down menu. We give you a short explanation of what these are, what they cover and, and how they work. So here's just one example, again, of another video that you could just use and import into your class. This is from, from Hope Willard at the University of Lincoln, um, who I think is on this uh, as well. So thank you, Hope. Um, and what she's given us is a short uh, introduction to the histories of Gregory of Tours. Um, Gregory of Tours, if you're teaching early medieval history, you almost always assign some passages from him, right? Whether it's in a textbook um, that has uh, uh, parts of his work already in it, or you're assigning your own. Um, and what Hope has given us is a really great introduction to Gregory, his background, because she's an expert on Gregory, uh, discussion questions, as you can see here, further readings, and also for your, your you know, if you want to know more, she gives you other people such as Ian Wood, who's one of the great Gregory of Tours scholars as well, um, some more reading that, that she would suggest, um, as well as translations, where to find uh, Gregory of Tours in translation if people want to know more. So it's a really set um, lesson plan that you can basically just import and use in your own teaching. And that's what we hope and want you to do. The other thing is we have, and Laura will cover this in more detail, what are called tool talks. And we have all types of these um, and we're expanding them. 
And here's just two, one from art history and one from a different way of, of teaching. And I'll go over both very briefly. The art history one you see on the, on the left gives you ways in which you can do uh, virtual exhibitions and uh, or digital exhibitions of spaces so that might be of interest to you. And the one on the right is uh, from uh, how to do podcasts, right? So many of us are looking for alternate ways of assignments because you know we might assign a five to seven page paper or a 10 to 15 page paper or whatever it might be. And that might be a lot harder now that libraries are closed or will be closed, the resources are harder to find. So what we've offered are tool talks in which Nick Paul here in this case walks you through how to create a podcast, right? So as an assignment, as an alternative, you might think about doing a podcast because again, most people at least have some form of recording technology in their phone um, to record podcasts. And so that's one way to potentially assign uh, different types of materials. And these are being added to as we speak. We have a few more that have already come over from the Medieval Academy in the last few days. We'll be adding a whole set uh, if you're a Byzantine historian, we've gotten a great Byzantine historian to basically give us 10 or 15 of these over the next few months. So we'll be adding those out and a number of others as we go. The other uh, thing that we also offer um, are translated sources. This is something that came up for many of you in the pre-questionnaire we sent out. Um, we are doing translations ourselves, but what we're doing is we're aggregating them as much as we can, right? So we're providing links to where you can find things um, and where you can go to get more, right? And these are, we've vetted most of these, so we've put them through and figured out what's there and what's not there. Um, so these are ways you can explore uh, other primary sources that you might want to use in your teaching. And one thing we're doing, I should say, moving forward is we're creating a more robust infrastructure around this over the next few months. So the searchability, tagability, all that stuff will be greatly improving. Um, and then finally, we also offer uh, other resources, right? So maybe you just want to use or you need images for a PowerPoint, you know, great art history images. So rather than Googling and finding the first example you can, what we're walking through are various databases, resources, other places where you can find all this information. So that's the overview of uh, the website and what we've put together in terms of the teaching side. And now, as I said, Laura is going to explore more about the particular uh, pedagogical uh, background of how we imagine this is going to look. So Laura. Thanks, Merle. Um, so as Merle said, I'd like to address uh, the approach towards digital pedagogy that we've adopted on the Middle Ages for Educators site. I'll begin by mentioning the primary reason for the site again, indeed why it exists at all, um, was to deliver resources and materials to students and instructors as they confronted the difficult realities of teaching and learning medieval subjects in the COVID-19 moment. Um, and while our initial impulse was to meet the immediate needs of our colleagues, um, we quickly realized that this was also an opportunity for us to take a hand in shaping medieval digital ped pedagogy for the future, rather than just sort of sitting passively and reacting to whatever came our way. Um, next slide, please. And the desire to do this uh, comes in great measure from the relatively short history of digital scholarship and the role, the great role that medievalists have played in it. Without, without entering too deeply into that timeline, I'll, I'll just say that medievalists have been using computer-based tools to examine their sources for well over a half a century. That's quite a long time in um, you know, the digital timeline. And that there's a rich history um, already of medieval scholarship based firmly in the digital medium. Moreover, there's no denying that we're now fully imbricated in a knowledge economy that relies upon the digital dissemination of information. So there's no time like the present to begin reckoning with what that means for teaching and for learning. Now, all of this to say um, that by embracing digital modes of learning about the medieval past, you're both learning the material and you're doing so using the most up-to-date methodologies in the field. Now, of course, this is both a challenge and an opportunity and we really hope that Middle Ages for Educators can help you with that. Next slide, please. So keeping all of this in mind, we'd like to suggest that there are four levels of engagement um, with this site and that they range from simply using it as a reference to finding new ways for you and your students to explore uh, medieval materials and to express your newfound knowledge using the digital methodologies uh, that other students of the medieval past have already found effective. So I'm just going to run through these, these levels quite quickly. In the first instance, you can see or you can use the site to find information and resources on the web related to the medieval past. And Merle's just gone over that with his explanation of the online resources portal. 
Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. We all know how to surf the web. Um, but you know, these are the, the, the things that we've collected and curated for you. Now, the second level involves consuming some of the content that was contributed directly to the site, these videos we're talking about, right? The short videos that usually run about 15 minutes. And they introduce a certain medieval source or topic. The videos are framed by discussion questions, links to online materials, and they often include a modern translation of the medieval source in question. So Daniel Smale, for example, tells a wonderful story about Elisette Paul, a woman whose entire family perished in the plague that ran through medieval, medieval Marseille. And her testimony before the city court um, that bears witness to this situation is translated and ready for students to interact with. Um, and so using these kinds of sources, these small 15 minute videos, it's relatively uh, self-explanatory. You go, you, you watch the video, you answer the discussion questions, and you move on. The third level of engagement with the site, um, examining medieval digital projects, also involves these short videos, um, but in this instance, an extra step is required. Students won't just be consuming information on the site, but will be introduced to a project that a fellow medievalist has made that encourages users to interact with medieval materials via the digital medium. Now, I'm going to give several examples of these um, kinds of project-based videos in just a second. And um, here we're starting to think about how the digital medium allows for a more user-driven pedagogical experience than sort of the more traditional teaching methods we're all used to. Now, the final level of engagement takes students and instructors from acting as consumers of digital content to being able to express themselves in the digital medium. And this is something I find really very exciting and really um, cutting edge in terms of pedagogy. Merle mentioned the tool talks before, and these talks will walk you through how to use individual tools or digital methodologies for teaching medieval materials in the classroom. These are tools and approaches that other medieval medievalists have used with quite a bit of, of success. And these tools demonstrate how fruitful the marriage between uh, medieval sources and computer-based learning can be. So I'm gonna take you at this point through a few of the resources uh, that we've uh, featured on the site. So next slide, please. The first example is a website called uh, Women of 1000 AD, which features the stories of individual women from all around the world uh, at around the year 1000. In the Middle Ages for Educators video, uh, Meg Hyland, the site's author, walks listeners through how she has created her own site um, and the methodologies behind her work. She introduces two women in particular and invites students to consider the lives of these women and the kinds of sources that historians use to uncover details um, and stories about these women's lives, even without the kinds of textual data that we might rely upon for, for later periods. Uh, next slide, please. In the same way, the video on the People of 1381 project explains the rationale behind the project and how their, their site is currently configured. And like the Women of 1000 project, the People of 1381 singles out individual actors during the peasant up uprising in the later 14th century in England and, and elsewhere. And it's an approach that I think can really resonate with students and get us away from these grand narratives that often um, occlude the lived realities of so many people who were active participants in these events. Um, the video on our site and then the links that accompany it send students to the primary sources that the project historians use to create these personal narratives. And in doing so, I think it really de demystifies um, the historian's craft for learners. Next slide, please. With the next project, we're moving beyond the sort of um, static presentation of historical information to a more interactive uh, form of digital learning. The Digital Grave is a user-driven edition of a, of a small old, old English poem, very small, 25 lines. Uh, and it includes an image of the original manuscript, a transcription of the text, and then a translation into modern English. So users can click uh, on the annotated manuscript to discover more about the poem, um, which happens to be about death, <laughs> a topic we're talking, talking a lot about these days. Um, but it also takes note of um, integrated activities created by the project author and meant for online learning or classroom use. Uh, next slide, please. The Independent Crusaders Mapping Project is a similarly interactive and user-driven project, but in this case, it features a map and associated timeline uh, to, to plot the departures of Crusaders from Europe um, leaving for the Holy Land 
outside of those numbered canonical crusades. It's really a fascinating um, online study. The site also presents the primary source material. In this case, we're talking about um, primarily medieval charters um, used to create the points on the map and the timeline. And it offers a partially translated edition of these sources for students to consider and to interact with. So it's a really great, great source. And all, all of these have videos that introduce um, the learners uh, to, these, to these projects. Next slide, please. And so finally, we move um, from the materials that invite users to participate in a project um, by manipulating what's, what's been presented already to teaching instructors and students, how they too might begin to express their historical learning in a digital format. Merle mentioned the tool text before, and here, here you'll see two more examples. The first by Jennifer Edwards, who explains how historical data from the Doomsday Book can be downloaded. So this is uh, material that's already out there, sort of data that's already out there, how it can be um, downloaded, reused, and then visualized by students themselves using something as simple as uh, an Excel sheet. Um, so it's a, it's a great uh, tool talk. And David Risley's tool talk on story maps outlines both the how and the why of grappling with spatial data for studying the medieval past. Um, and offers a few easy to use platforms that allow students uh, of history to craft a narrative that plays with both the spatial and the temporal component. Uh, maps, of course, are something that historians tend to work with quite readily, and I think this tool talk does a good job of opening the door to that kind of digital learning. So now I'll pass the microphone off to Sarah, who's going to address some of the specific feedback that you all sent us um, when you registered. Uh, thank you so much, Laura and, and Merle. And that, that is uh, the first thing I have to say is that uh, however many months ago when, when we all suddenly found ourselves uh, shut down and paused and, and so on, uh, we, we had the idea that we wanted to do something for our community. And uh, Laura and Merle have have done such amazing work to make this possible. We're, we're doing this uh, for a community we all care so much about, um, and also just to highlight and share the amazing work that's already there, but that is often so difficult to find, um, including on the website, which uh, we understand. And we are trying really hard to fix it, and we now have more help, and we promise uh, we're, we're doing everything that we can. Um, and to, the, uh, to that point, uh, so we are three medievalists. Um, we know what we think. Uh, we need to know what it is that you think, how to make this site work best for you, because this site is made uh, with the intention of helping anyone who wants to or has to teach anything medieval uh, with digital component, teach it better. And so that is why we asked the questions that we asked. And Merle, if you could please take us to our next slide. Uh, so we asked you just to remind you and to thank you again for answering, for taking the time to answer when we are all so busy and so tired. Uh, we asked what barriers you encounter in teaching pre-modern topics. We asked what features we might add that might help, if there were any specific materials, and so on. So those are the things we asked. Next slide, please, again, Merle. I know I should say slide, please. Uh, so uh, there were many answers and all really helped us think and I promise you we read them all and we studied them all and we still hope for more feedback from you. We couldn't talk about all of them today um, but I wanted to feature the ones that came up the most often or or, um, or hit me the hardest because I realized they were things that we had failed to uh, address. So uh, many of you were concerned about students lack of knowledge about the Middle Ages, that they come into your classrooms knowing absolutely nothing about the Middle Ages, the relevant religions, and any, anything at all. Um, and that some of you are non-specialist teachers uh, and need help figuring out what it is that is best to say. 
Uh, language skills was another big issue. Uh, many students can only read in English, uh, but also some students cannot read in English. And so I will just quickly point to one site, Open Iberia America is on our website. Uh, a link is on our website. But I will also point out that no matter what language skills you have in the classroom, all students can be taught to uh, transcribe. And I invite you to ask our colleague Laura Moriale more because she knows how to do this and has completely convinced me that any students could do this and could really benefit from it. And it's a way for us to all come together with the difficulties of research, but also the difficulties of language, which is something that many students who are not native speakers of whatever you know community they happen to be in feel particularly keenly. And so um, ask Laura, she'd be very happy to answer all of your questions. Uh, also, pre-modern materials in general can be very difficult for students to understand because pre-modern materials often feel very strange and complicated. Um, we who try to summarize them briefly can certainly understand uh, the student's difficulty. Uh, and also for all of us trying to teach using online materials, uh, we find on the one hand on the internet, either an overwhelming number of materials and no way to uh, discern which ones are good and which ones are bad, what translation is good, what translation is bad, what scholars now think or thought they think, whether these scholars are reliable, all of these problems or not enough that you really need to teach on a certain topic, either because it's what your department has asked you to do or because your students are passionate about it, but uh, you can't find it. So there's that. And then there are also uh, myths about the Middle Ages that are all too um, much a part of our world. And how do we address that and engage with that and help our students work from that to what we actually do think uh, may or may not have been going on in the Middle Ages and can learn from. Um, and then many of you asked for specific topics. Art and architecture was a, a large uh, category plus gender, global, and literary, and K through 12 friendly recommendations. So some of this was already covered by uh, Laura and Merle in what you heard already. Some of this I will speak to. The rest of this, uh, if I don't, I hope you will ask or ask me more if I haven't said enough. So next slide, please, Merle. Uh, so first of all, what we can't really do, although we wish we could, we wish we had K-12 expertise. Uh, we don't, and uh, we don't feel uh, we don't feel it right for us to to claim that we could say this is perfect for sixth graders because what do we know? Despite some of us having you know experienced sixth graders personally, uh, anyway. So apologies, but uh, we can tell you who can help, which is one of the other main things that we try to provide with this website. So. Um, please go to these links. Uh, those of you who are school teachers or who have homeschool teaching needs, uh, there are these K through 12 resources on the medieval world via the Medieval Academy of America, including lesson plans, including digital planning, and, and there's more um, that I'll tell you about in a moment. Uh, the Sites of Encounter in the Medieval World has some excellent resources. Exploring and Teaching Medieval History in Schools is a UK run program with UK, um, you know, breakdown uh, and, and UK focus in what they offer, but it's still very useful and very rich and tied in with the incredible resources for history and the pre-modern that uh, our colleagues um, in that other country offer. Uh, and finally, Asia for Educators from Columbia University was one of our main sites of inspiration when we set up this website. And they have wonderful teaching resources, uh, including lesson plans, including primary sources and more uh, specifically for Asia. And that's both primary uh, and secondary and, and beyond. Next slide, please, Merle. 
so myths about the Middle Ages is something we should have thought about when we put this website together as a key category. Uh, we're working on it. Uh, there will be more. Uh, there is more already in the works that we just haven't had a chance to upload, but it will be there imminently. Um, in the meantime, there, I can point to, there was an article in Time magazine by Matthew Gabrielli and Mary Rambaran Olm on misuse of the Middle Ages. There was on Monday um, a, uh, a webinar on race, racism, and teaching the Middle Ages. And on History Extra, Hannah Skoda goes through 12 medieval myths quickly and coherently and accessibly. There's both uh, a spoken and written out component that you can use in your teaching. Next slide, please, Merle. Uh, so here's some things we have done, um, but there's more to do and please ask us for more. So you already heard very briefly about one of the tool talks about how to use art steps, which is free and looks fairly easy uh, to use, although I haven't tried yet, but I'm going to because it seems amazing. Uh, so we have a tool talk from Elizabeth Lastra that shows you how to use art steps to do virtual art exhibits. And this is something that students can do with very limited um, resources. And they can combine it with some of the other links that we have on our pages for sure. Uh, there was also a Medieval Academy webinar presentation that included art steps along with a discussion of how to teach art history online. That talk was given yesterday, no, two days ago, two days ago. Uh, it's all one big day, um, hosted by the Medieval Academy with some help from us, and it will be on our site and the Medieval Academy's website soon for you to watch. There's also some really wonderful resources for online teaching of medieval art that the International Center for Medieval Art put together. The University of Kent has some really nice resources. Uh, and the Courtauld Institute has provided some video church crawls uh, and also some other examples of medieval architecture, which is just a really nice way to provide your students or your, your home bound selves with a video opportunity to visit some of the sites that we all miss so terribly. Next slide, please, Merle. Uh, so we've also done what, uh, some things to address the global Middle Ages. Um, so we have, uh, first of all, the, the joy of being able to announce uh, that the Medieval Academy and National Humanities has a collaborative myth-busting online course coming in September on Medieval Africa and Africans. I, am, I think I'm remembering correctly that there is a large component of that that's K through 12. Um, in any case, that should be a real resource for all of us who want to include teaching pre-modern Africa and Africans uh, in our work. And we will be posting information on that in our events link um, as soon as I, th I think we will. Anyway, we will. It's in September. I think it's, a, I don't remember the exact date. Uh, Stanford, Medi Stanford Global Medieval Sourcebook has excellent primary sources and images in translation from all over. So that's a great resource. Teaching Medieval Slavery is a, is a wonderful new resource put together by Hannah Barker and a bunch of other people. There's primary sources in translation, there's maps, there's I think lesson plans, it's very rich. Uh, the Yale Silk Road project is just worth, just click on it uh, if you're interested. It, it really, is a wonderful resource for teaching world history, for teaching trade and travel. And the Dun Huang materials, that image is from one of the Buddhist caves there. Uh, and the digital Dun Huang Buddhist cave site, it's, it's well worth using or just looking at in your free time if you need something beautiful in your life right now. Next slide, please, Merle. Uh, we also have a bunch of different resources on gender and literary things, which is something that people asked about. So there's two videos with lesson plans and primary sources and translation. 
Um, there's also another project that looks at a peasant woman um, and her engagement with uh, some, some legal disputes. The Medieval Women's Latin Letters is a wonderful resource for trying to study women and gender um, with letters written to and by women. Um, and then there are some legal sources that have plenty of material that you can use to engage in you, uh, discussions that involve women and gender. Next slide, please. So that is in short, some of what we have and uh, please take the time now to ask your questions. We're very eager to hear from all of you. And I want to thank especially uh, Emily and Megan for their work organizing this and the AHA for hosting this and all of you for taking the time to come. We'll say more of that as we go, but I will stop talking because what we want now is to listen to you. So uh, Sarah, Laura and Merle, do you guys have any final words you'd like to say or any way you wanna wrap this up? I would like to quickly say we're not going anywhere. <laughs> so if any of you have think of something else that you want us to put on the website or anything else you want us to do with the website, you've been so polite about not sharing your frustrations with the website. Um, and, and I hope that you won't hesitate. We really, we're doing this for you. If you find it frustrating and can't use it, we really do want to know so that we can try to fix it. So please, please contact us, contact us any way you like. You can contact us through the website, you can email us. Uh, we're just, we're very eager to make this as useful as possible for all of you as you uh, try to get your teaching together in whatever form it's going to be um, in the coming weeks and months. Yeah, and I'll just say, if you do have um, suggestions, like now is the time. We're about to um, move towards a, a, a different kind of platform and um, make some big changes. Um, the first being, of course, the um, searchability of the site. We know that that's a problem. But to tell you the truth, it's really just a, a um, you know, we, we started, we, we, I think we launched in April, is that right? Yeah, it's just been the very quick nature um, and the robust participation of our, of our colleagues. So um, we understand that there are problems, but do please let us know now because then we can fix it um, going forward. Yeah, I'll just quickly say thanks to everyone. There are a bunch of great questions and things that I think we are now gonna go look to build into the website that hopefully will help you. So questions on what we teach, what to teach on early Islam, we can build in some videos on that. Um, but what, what's actually progressed the site quite a bit, uh, as Laura and Sarah, I think have already basically said is, full just basically saying, here's what I need. Um, can you do this for us? Do you know someone who does it? And we've actually taken that and been able to create videos for people basically from scratch with question collection, right? So it's really hard for us to just kind of think of things. Um, but I think you've given us a bunch of areas that I think we should do, whether it be feudalism or the fall of Rome, et cetera, et cetera, these kind of big picture questions. I think we'll start building those in. Um, but if there's other ones, we can go out and harass our friends and browbeat them and basically say, we owe you a beer if we ever get to see you again. Um, and they will make these things for us um, because it's been pretty successful so far in terms of getting people to do specific things. So. Yes, surprisingly so. <laughs> but thank you very much to the AHA. I really appreciate you featuring the, the site. And uh, we hope to you know, work with you all too to, um, in, in conversation about what historians need and, and, and how we can respond to that. Yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to just say thank you to Sarah and Laura and Merle for joining us today. I really learned a lot about uh, the Middle Ages, but also some of the really interesting work that's out there. Um, and I want to say thank you for taking the time to take questions, both in the registration and then in the Q&A. And I'm looking forward to seeing what develops as it goes forward. So uh, with that, I think we'll go ahead and declare this event over, but I hope you will join us for future online teaching forum events. We drop, I dropped a link in the chat um, and we'll also send it in a follow-up e follow email, I'm sure. So thank you very much for joining us and I hope to see you again soon sometime. Thank you. Thank you.